Hey, CF Young Adults, welcome to service. My name's Nina, this is Lewis. What's We're up? part of the Young Adults team here at CF. We're so excited you're joining us. Yeah, and I, um, this is not a normal service, right? We're not in the rooms that we're normally in, but that doesn't mean that tonight's not going to be a blast. I don't know about you. I'm a Florida native, though. I've been in Florida my whole life. I've been through many hurricanes, many storms. Nina, however, you just moved in from where? From Texas, from Dallas, Texas. Okay. We do not have hurricanes there. No, you don't. No. How do you feel about this one? Um, honestly, I feel good, but yeah. my family, not so much. They're asking no. my evacuation plan, making no. sure I'm prepared. Yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness, that is, you, come on somebody. <laughs> uh, you can help me out, okay? We've got some people here who have lived in Florida for a long time, share some hurricane tips. Share Please. some ways, like this is your first, one of your first storms. Yeah. We gotta figure out how to ride this well. And so here's a, here's a couple of tips that I came up with. One, uh, you need to make sure that you get your essential items from the store. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about your Doritos. Ooh. I'm talking about your beef jerky. I'm Absolutely. talking about your gummy worms. I'm talking about your boxes of Celsius. That's what Kalisa would want <laughs> me to get. Uh, you need to make sure you got the essential yeah. items. You don't need toilet paper and water. This is not that big of a deal. You can just focus on the snacks. They're the best. Oh my gosh. Uh, second, uh, I'd recommend that you pick the right location. Yep. To, to take your pictures at the beach. What? Come on somebody, right? <laughs> you go to the beach, the, the wind's blowing, the palm trees are swaying, but you take this picture, it makes you look like the ultimate Floridian. You could be a Florida girl. Listen, Lewis. You've heard of Florida I man. Don't, I don't know if I'm there yet. I don't know if I'm there yet. I don't think I'm gonna be going to the beach. I think I'm gonna be chilling at home. I'm gonna snuggle my dog. Okay. And we're gonna watch a movie. Yeah. Drop it in the chat if you're a movie goer, not a beach goer during a hurricane. No. I need to I'm, know. I'm headed right into it. Go swim in the intercoastal. Like, have fun. Oh my gosh. Have fun. I, I think the know. third thing you need to do is get your house in order, okay? Yeah. Get your house in order for the hurricane party, somebody. You need to bring <laughs> all your people with you. You got your snacks, you've got it all. You need to you need to go through the storm well, so we're trying to help you yes, out. Yes, but you gotta to do you it. Out. You gotta do it with the right people. You do. You do. You gotta get the right people around you, which is why you need to text CFYA to 441441. <laughs> there you go, slid it in, it was perfect. Uh, we really believe that yet yeah, a storm's coming, a storm came. Uh, but man, we go through storms in life. And so the best way to ride through the storms in life is to go through it with the right people around Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Which is why we do what we do. So you need to text CFYA to 441. 441. That's the best way to start a conversation on how we can get you connected to this community and resource you to live the life that God has called you to live. Yes. I love that our church is chock full of resources Absolutely. for you. Nina, tell us about them. Yes. And we also got a podcast to help yes. resource our young adults. It's called yeah. Young and Adulting. And you got to listen to it. We're in season three. We're dropping a podcast every single Thursday. So this one's called How to Manage Time. Ooh, I need that. I need how that. How to manage time. Absolutely. I always want to maximize my my time we know you guys do too so check it out it's on youtube mm -hmm. it's on spotify and it's on the podcast app there you go hey as you are picking up your hurricane snacks i'm going to encourage you to pick up some extra non-perishable food items why because thanksgiving is coming up in a couple weeks and there are many families in our church yeah. many families in our region who for some reason or another they're not able to have the thanksgiving meal that they may have expected or wanted so as a church we're going to step in and meet the need yeah. and all of us together i love this this is an everybody challenge from the kids to the grandparents the young adults we're going to be carrying this uh, we're going to bring food with us to church on sunday i think there's an amazon wish list yep there's a list uh, online you can yeah, find all the foods to bring go to social media but we're gonna make sure that we resource people well for Thanksgiving coming up in just a couple weeks. Yes, and guys, we have an event coming up called Retreat. Yes. I'm sure you guys are cheering at home. If you were there last year, you know how incredible it is for going back to Vero this, this February, February 24th through the 26th. It's just a time to reset, recharge, and just get filled. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, so you guys wanna be there. Uh, worship services, we've yep. got messages. We also have paintballing, we've got painting, yeah. we've got coffee bars and water sports, whatever it is, so fun. we got something for you. And my favorite part about retreat is it's in February. So that's not hurricane Woo. season. So we're gonna <laughs> be able to go and you can go with confidence. So make sure that you get your ticket. Well, friends, we're about to jump into the rest of the service tonight. And I know it may look different, but I'm telling you, the Spirit of God can meet you right yes. where you are. We're about to go into a time of worship, and then Pastor Kate is gonna teach, uh, uh, continuing this series, Mythbusters. There are some things that we've believed, some myths that we live, that we need to bust in order to live the life that God has called us to. So I wanna encourage you today, 
to turn the volume down to get rid of the distractions. I mean, turn the volume up. That's, that's volume what you up. need to be encouraged to do. <laughs> turn the volume up. We're about to go into worship. This is the time for you to meet with God and then hear the truth of God. Yes. And Nina and I will be right up after that. So let's join the room for worship. Come on, we'll just stand up wherever you're at. We're gonna declare to that we are no longer slaves to sin, but Jesus lives in us today. Come on, we sing. Arise, my soul. Matthew 14, Jesus calls Peter to step out into the raging water off of his boat. And while the things in front of him, the raging seas, the, the howling winds seemed impossible to Peter, he stepped out in faith. Now, Peter wasn't perfect. He let his fear and his doubt creep into his life and hold him back sometimes. But in this moment, Peter made the conscious decision to trust Jesus. So today, in this moment, wherever you're at, however you're feeling, let's make the conscious decision to trust Jesus today with everything we've got, with everything that's holding us back. Let's give it all to him and surrender, amen? Come on. Come on, we sing. When it does. 
doesn't go my way I know that it is not the end I'm trusting you have better plans I haven't even dreamt of yet I know that you were for me When everything's against me I put on my hope in you Oh Jesus Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Kate and it is so great to be with you today. Although I wish that I was in the same room with you, I am still grateful for technology. Aren't you that we can still gather, we can still be around God's word and, and hear from him through his word, through our screens that we're watching this on. I loved our time of worship and I love that God's presence isn't somewhere that we go. 
it's where we are because God is with us wherever we are. And so I'm expecting that today he's got a fresh word for each and every one of you on the other side of that screen. And um, I'm just going to trust and believe in that. And so before we get started, let's just uh, invite God into this space. Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather um, today around your word. Uh, God, I thank you for what you've already been doing in, in the hearts of each and every one of us in uh, our time together in worship. And I just pray that our posture is going to continue to be one that's leaning into what you, Holy Spirit, want to speak to us today through this message. Um, we are so thankful, God, for who you are. We're thankful that you're in control and that you are a God uh, is that is yes and amen to your promises. And so, Holy Spirit, we know you're here, but we're just asking for a fresh infuse today. Would you bless everything uh, that we say and we do and may everything we say and do bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you might be like, who is this chick that's teaching the word tonight? Like I said, I'm Pastor Kate and I have the privilege of serving on our Christ Fellowship team here in South Florida and I love it. And here's just a few things, like just a few things that may be helpful to know about me before we get started. Um, let's see. I'm from the state of Wisconsin. But I do want to let you know that I'm not a cheesehead. I do not cheer for the Green Bay Packers. I am a Chicago sports fan. I do think that I picked the wrong teams because we don't usually win anything. But hey, go Bears, go Cubs. Um, another thing, I am from Wisconsin, but I tend to talk with a Southern twang. I know it's a little bit confusing, but I've got a roommate who's from Mississippi, and I guess she's rubbed off on me. Let's see, what else do you need to know? Oh, this might put some of you a little on edge. I don't like peanut butter and I don't like bananas. So I don't like peanut butter and bananas. I know that threw some of you into a loop, but those will not be in any hurricane readiness pack ever for me. But I, tell, I will tell you what is, donuts. I love me some donuts. Are there any donut connoisseurs out there? Come on, I'm gonna stop right there because I literally will talk the next 20 minutes about donuts. So just know those are just a few silly things about me. You know, one other thing that I want to let you know and let you in on is the fact that my mom hates the sound of cracking knuckles. So she would tell my brothers and I all through our childhood that if we cracked our knuckles that we would get swollen knuckles and get arthritis. Well, I can stand before you today and say that was indeed a myth because I've been cracking my knuckles for almost 30 years and look at these guys. Don't they look good? Not swollen and no arthritis. Myth, mom, it was a myth. Here's another one. Had a pool uh, in my early childhood and even throughout my childhood. And into my adulthood, people would say, hey, you can't eat and then go swimming. You're gonna get a stomach cramp. It's not gonna work. Don't, no, don't eat, don't swim. And so literally for most of my life, I would never eat and then go swimming. It's a myth because the fact that I moved to Southern California in my adulthood and man, I would tell you, me and my friend, we would go get the best breakfast burrito. This sucker was like the size of my head. I would eat that whole thing, one sitting on the sand and then run myself into the Pacific Ocean and no cramps. So, hey, I think I just busted another myth. It is not true. So you're like, OK, why are we talking about myths? Well, if you haven't joined us last week, we're in a myth buster series. We're actually called to be myth busters. And you're like, Pastor Kate, why, why would you say that? Because we actually need to know the truth of God's word so that we're not just believing everything that anybody else says or culture says as something to be true. No, we got to measure it up against God's word and what God says, who God is and what God says about you and me. See, myths like don't crack your knuckles, you'll get fat knuckles or don't eat and swim. Those have little consequences, but I care too much about each and every one of you to believe myths that are ultimately lies from the enemy that are going to lead you down a path of destruction and even more so rob you from the full abundant life that God has for you. So we've got we've to bust some myths up today. And so here's the myth that we're going to bust. Are you ready for it? Tonight we are going to myth, uh, excuse me, bust the myth, my life is out of control. Let me reiterate that so you don't miss it. The myth that we are going to bust is my life is out of control. Have you ever felt like that? That your life is out of control? Or maybe that's how you feel right now. Well, hey, 
you're not alone if you felt that. There's actually someone in scripture that we could probably argue may have felt that not once, but several times throughout his life. We're talking about Joseph. Joseph that we find in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. You may know Joseph associated with uh, the colored coat, right? Uh, the, color the color technicolor dream coat, I can't even talk about it. It's a Broadway musical, it's awesome, but this has actually happened in real life, in scripture. And I just wanna take a few moments to talk about Joseph in his life. But tonight I'm gonna give you like the 500 foot thousand view. Um, I'm gonna go so fast it might actually sound like I'm rapping, but I am not. Uh, I might not come up for air very much. So if I pass out, our films team here will take care of me. They'll get me back, it's all good. But I do want to let you in a little bit on what Joseph's life, life looked like. So again, we're gonna be covering Genesis chapter 37 through 50. Are you ready, set, here we go. Okay, so Joseph was one of 12. He was the youngest. And let me tell you, he was the favorite child. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Scripture's clear. He was his father's favorite. His father gave him a beautiful colored coat because he was his favorite. And guess what? His brothers, they didn't like that too much, okay? Then Joseph, he's out tending uh, sheep. He's a, he's a shepherd, age 17. God gives him a few dreams. And in these dreams, his brothers, his actual whole family are submitting to him and bowing down to him. Joseph, he probably should have kept those dreams to himself, right? But instead, he shares them with his family. Not the brightest idea, Joseph, but he does, which turns his brothers from hating him into actually wanting to kill him. Yep, that's right. His brothers now want to kill him. So what do they do? They plot his death. However, one brother says, mm, hey, maybe we shouldn't kill our brother, but instead let's go ahead and beat him brutally and then throw him in a ditch and then go back and tell our father that a wild animal has eaten him. Guys, I'm not making this stuff up. It is in the Bible. This is what is happening to Joseph. And so he's laying in a ditch. He actually gets picked up and he gets sold into slavery, okay? Um, he actually becomes a slave in Potiphar's house who was, uh, was a chief officer in Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh of Egypt in his kingdom. So he's enslaved by Potiphar. Now the story gets even crazier, right? Because Potiphar's wife makes advances at Joseph, wants to have an affair with Joseph. And Joseph says, hey, no, I'm not gonna do that. Potiphar's wife, she's not happy with it. So she actually construes a lie and makes Potiphar believe that Joseph has indeed slept with her. So what does Potiphar do? He throws Joseph into prison. So now you've got an innocent man in prison. While Joseph there, he, he remains integrous. His character stays true to who God has called him to be. And guess what? He gets promoted in prison. He actually gets promoted in prison. And while he's in prison, he actually interprets two dreams for uh, a chief baker and a chief cupbearer from Pharaoh's uh, kingdom that happened to be in jail for a little bit. He interprets their dreams. And guess what? When they get out of jail, these two guys, their dreams come true just like Joseph had said. And so one day, Pharaoh then has a dream and he's distraught about it. And he's like, I need someone to tell me what this dream means. And, and, the, and the one guy goes, wait, I know a guy who can interpret dreams. And, and Pharaoh goes and gets Joseph out of jail, has Joseph interpret the dream. Guess what? Joseph interprets the dream correctly and warns Pharaoh that Egypt's about to have seven, ter or seven great years, excuse me, of harvest. But then there's going to be seven terrible years of drought. And so Egypt is able to prepare for this. Pharaoh's like, who is this guy? He actually then promotes Joseph, right? Thrown in a ditch, thrown in prison innocently. Now Joseph is promoted to second in charge in the kingdom. And when those seven years of the, of the fruitful harvest are over, sure enough, enter into the seven years of drought. But Egypt's good because Joseph interpreted the dream and they were prepared. Lo and behold, one day, a group of guys comes in to Joseph and says, hey, we need food. And Joseph recognizes that those are his brothers. See, his brothers had traveled from a different land where they were out of food and came to Egypt where there was to beg and to plead for food. They're begging and pleading to Joseph, the brother that they had beaten and left for dead and told their father was dead. Joseph doesn't show his identity to his brother, but rather he gives them what they need. <laughs> Can you imagine that, right? The, the very people that tried to destroy him, the very people that wanted to kill him, that left him for dead, he's now giving them food. And here's the thing, he not only saves Egypt from starvation, he actually saves his family from it as well. I mean, Joseph's got a wild story. And that was like, I mean, I didn't even do it justice. 
And I, when, I, when I go through Joseph's story, I think to myself, man, if anybody could have questioned if God was in control, if anybody could have said, my life is out of control, I mean, arguably, I, I, think, it, I think it would have been Joseph. But we see throughout his story that he never gave up, he never lost hope, he never despaired. And that's because he believed God was who God says he is, excuse me. And he had a posture of that. He surrendered and trusted what he knew about God and what God had shown him and told him. So the question then begs us, so was Joseph in control of his life or was he not? And I would actually, actually argue that it's both and. See, I would say that Joseph was not in control of a lot of the circumstances that happened to him, but he was in complete control through them. Because the truth is, is that number one, God is in control. And number two, we have the responsibility for the posture that we take in our lives, and that is to trust God and to surrender to him. So if you haven't been taking notes, I would encourage you at this point to jot some things down. And if you have, that's awesome. Here's some more things to write down. But here are, there are two points that I really want you to take home from God's word today. The first one, God is in control, okay? Joseph at any point could have thrown his hands up and could have said, what, really, God? You're so in control, then why am I left in the pit to die? Why have I been wrongly imprisoned? He had so many opportunities where that could have been his posture, but he knew that God was in control. The truth is God has always been in control from the beginning of time and he will always be in control. Joseph knew that and he trusted it. He trusted God was in control. You know, in Psalm 120, or excuse me, Psalm 139, 16, it says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. The verse says every moment, not just the good moments, but every moment. God sees it, God knows it, and God is in control of it. There's not a day of your life that has happened, that is happening, or that will happen that God doesn't see and that he doesn't know and that he's not in control of. That's not a frightening thought. That's actually a super encouraging thought for us today. And I don't, I don't want that to flee. I want that to linger and to sit with you. You know, at the end of Joseph's story, like I said, after all that he had been through, his brothers are there asking him essentially to save them. And what does Joseph do? He doesn't just feed them physically, uh, but he also, he also saves them, saves their lives, and, and he forgives them, and, and reconciliation, and there's restoration in his family. And we see in, in, at the end of Joseph's story in Genesis 50, 20, this is what Joseph says to his brothers. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. In those moments where Joseph was in a pit or in prison, he had no idea that going through those things were going to put him in a position that would save an entire nation <laughs> and nations beyond. And even more than that, was going to save his family and preserve a bloodline. The bloodline that ultimately the savior of the world, Jesus Christ, is going to come through. Joseph was submitted to God being in control. And we know that the God that Joseph served is the same God that you and I serve today. In Malachi 3, 6, it says that God is saying this, I am Lord and I do not change. And in the New Testament, we see in Hebrews 13, 8, where it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. God is in control. God is faithful. I think it's so interesting that Joseph's life was way before Jesus came to the earth. And yet, 
he trusted that God was in control. How much more can we know today, this side of Jesus coming and dying on the cross and rising again, that we can trust God is who he says he is and he's gonna do what he says he's gonna do and that he's working all things for good. Joseph was before there was a promised land. Joseph was before that there was a savior of the world. His posture was submitted to knowing God was in control. You know, and, and now we live on the other side of Jesus coming to the earth and saving us. And so we can fully put our trust in as we look throughout scripture and throughout history, God's faithfulness and God's goodness and God working all things for good. Can you trust that today? That God is in control? You know, in the New Testament, there's a guy named Paul. <laughs> and Paul, man, he used to persecute Christians. He was the worst persecutor of Christians. And yet, he ends up having this radical encounter with Jesus Christ, and he becomes a radical believer for Jesus Christ, and actually God uses him to birth the church. A guy that was persecuting Christians is now the biggest advancer of the gospel in his time. You see, Paul tells us in Romans 8, 28, a very similar thing that Joseph had told us way back in Genesis. This is what Paul says in Romans 8, 28. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to their purpose for him. You know what, Paul, he actually goes up and loses his life for the sake of the gospel. But he knew that God was working all things for good. But I wanna let you know there is an enemy out there. The enemy is real. He is coming to seek, to kill, and destroy anything that is good and that is from above. But guess what? He's not better than God. He's not stronger than God. He's not more powerful than God. He's not all-knowing like God. And Jesus, by his death and his resurrection, ultimately defeated the, de the devil, the enemy. And we can live in that victory. We can live in that power. The second thing I want us to know is this. We are in control of our response to trust and to surrender. So the first thing to know is that God is in control. The second thing to know is that we're in, our, we're, we're in control of our response. And our response to knowing God's in control is to submit and to surrender to him. If we go back to our, bo our boy Joe, remember him, Joseph, uh, he was out of control of a lot of things. He couldn't control a lot of things in his life, but we can look at his posture throughout his life. Our posture and our response, it's our responsibility. It can be hard at times, but we, we need to be surrendered to the fact that God is in control no matter what we're going through. The enemy would love nothing more than for you to believe the lie that you are a victim to your circumstance. Tell him to go back to where he belongs because that is not true. We can see from Joseph's life, we can see from Paul's life, and we can see from the lives of countless others in scripture and even in our own lives that when, when we trust that God's in control and, and we trust and we submit to that, we have the freedom to choose our response. And when we choose out of surrender and trust to him, he is going to work it for good. So it may feel like my life is out of control, but we don't have to respond that way because we know that God is in control and that we can be surrendered and trust to him. You know, we need to intentionally think about our posture through our circumstances. What is your posture today with what you're going through? You know, whenever anything happens, we need to relinquish control to God being in control and then lay it down, submit and trust him. And you may say, well, Pastor Kate, this is great, <laughs> but how am I supposed to do that? You don't know what I'm walking through. I may not know today what you're walking through, but I know some of the things that I've walked through and I can say, man, it, at times, it's not easy to do this. <laughs> You know, I think about my childhood, and I grew up in a, a broken home, a dysfunctional home. I had to move out um, when I was 16 from my home because it wasn't safe. There were definitely moments where I questioned God being in control. There were definitely moments where I thought, why is this happening to me? Why, why, why? But I was reminded through mentors, through God's word, through being in community at church, that there is a lot of things that we don't know the answers to, 
But there is something that we do know, and that's the God that we serve, and that he's in control, and he is a good God. I also think about, you know, mo- most, most recently, um, I had a back injury that happened, and I was in an immense amount of pain for, for months, for chronic pain, and I prayed that God would heal me. And I had people pray that God would heal me. I moved across the country because I was following what God asked me to do, thinking, oh, certainly now I'm going to see the good. My back's going to stop hurting. And it didn't. Day after day, I didn't want to go to work. Day after day, I was having a hard time. I, I could have very easily thrown up my hands and just said, it is what it is. But that should never be our posture because we know that God is in control. <laughs> And we know that if we just trust that and we surrender to that, that he's going to work things for good. And guess what? I'm here today after surgery. It took surgery to correct it. But I'm here now saying God worked things for good. And he's revealing those things to me even now, just a few weeks after back surgery. So I don't know what you're going through, but I want to encourage you. I want to build your faith today. That when you trust God is in control and you respond appropriately with your actions that are going to be trusting him and surrendering your life to him, he's with you, he's for you, he's working on your behalf, and he is going to work it for good. So here's two things really quickly that I want to leave with you today. Practical steps. Number one, ask for help. (laughs) Ask for wisdom, right? It's okay to ask for help. We should ask for help. Scripture is clear that we should be taking responsibility to ask for wisdom. And thankfully, God is a God who when we ask, he will respond and he will help us. I would encourage you to get in a rhythm of doing that and see what God does. To see how God is truly in control. Another thing that I want to just point out is that in James 1, 5, James tells us, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. James knew this important truth, that we need to ask for wisdom, and God will give it to us. Here's a helpful acronym for us. Just pray, right? Like actually pray, but the Acronym stands for these things. Prioritize prayer. Get in a regular rhythm and routine of talking to God, thanking him, asking him for wisdom. The R is resource yourself in God's word. Don't stop reading his word. Don't stop being in spaces and places where you're getting taught God's word. The A is for accept God's answer. Whatever he says, remember, we're in control of our response to trust and surrender. And then why? is yearn for more wisdom. Yearn, what a word. I feel very old saying that, but it, it, it works for the acronym, right? Yearn for his wisdom, which means long for his wisdom. And the second thing that we can do, we ask for help, we ask for wisdom, and the second thing that we do is we invite others in to help us. I'm super passionate about this, friends. Who are the people in your life who are speaking not just information, thoughts, or opinions in your life, but are actually speaking wisdom into your life that are coming alongside of you. Who do you need to ask? Who do you need to invite into your life to help you? (laughs) You know, I'm not talking about who are the people on Instagram that you need to follow. No, no, I'm talking about real human beings bumping shoulders, walking alongside of you. Who are those that are further along down the road that could share wisdom with you, that could walk you through something? I didn't want to end this time together without an invitation, without extending an invitation to you to say, do you feel like your life is out of control? To remind you that it's a myth and invite you into giving God complete control. And if you've never said with your mouth or believed in your heart that that God is in control and that Jesus is the savior of the world, I wanna give you an opportunity right now to do that. It is the best decision you can make and I know that your life is gonna be radically changed and transformed when you do that. So if that's you, whatever room you're in, whatever car you're in, wherever you're at, I do, I I wanna invite you to raise your hand. It might feel a little bit awkward, like there's nobody in the room, or maybe you're watching this with a few people and you're like, this is weird. It's okay. 
It's okay. It's an acknowledgement of saying, yes, I need to accept that God is in control of my life. I need to accept that he sent his son to die for my sins and, and to rise again so that I can spend eternity with him and give me the power of Holy Spirit to walk with me, to guide me, to equip me in everything I do. So if that's you, throw your hand up. So if your hand is up, what I want you to do, you already feel weird with your hand up, it's okay. Now I want you to actually repeat after me because scripture says that we, we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. So let's pray. Would you repeat after me? Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are in control. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you care for me. And I thank you that you are working all things for good on my behalf. I ask for your forgiveness for the times where I haven't surrendered and I haven't given control. Holy Spirit, I ask that you will help me to live a fully surrendered life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. If I was in a room, we'd all be clapping because guess what? This is the best decision that you could have ever made. And scripture even says that the angels are going crazy in heaven. So our team's going to come up in just a little bit and give some next steps for you. But if you said yes, congratulations. And we are excited to walk this journey with you. We're excited to, to be a part of your crew, to help you, to give wisdom, and, and to see what God's going to do in and through your life. And I'm just going to close with this now. I want to pray over the rest of us. I just wanna pray over you, your situation, and, and, and pray that God would just bless you, so let's go ahead and do that. God, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it, it brings fresh revelation to us. God, I thank you for the way that you are working things for good. God, I thank you for um, the fact that you are in control, that you are the same, that we can trust you, and so we say yes and amen to that, and I pray for each individual who's watching this message. God, I pray that wherever they are, they would feel your presence. God, that they would feel your warm embrace, that they would be empowered by your Holy Spirit, that, they are, that faith would begin to rise in them, that trust would grow deep within them, and that they would walk confidently in life knowing that you are with them and that you are for them and that you are in control. So would you bless them? Would you keep them? Make your glorious face shine upon them. God, we thank you and we praise you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. And all the young adults said, wherever you are, amen. Well, if you said yes today, I'm so proud of you. You said yes to Jesus. You raised your hand. You're going to become a Christian. That is the best decision that yes. you could make. And we want to resource you. We want to walk with you because it's not just a decision. It's a journey. And so I want to encourage you to text the word yes to the number 441. 441. We're going to give you an ebook. It's going to be the next seven days, how to walk in the life that Jesus has for you. Very practical, very helpful. If that's you today, uh, text yes to 441-441 and we're going to get that to you. Yes, and even though we're online today, we're still going to connect in community. We know groups are the best part of the night. And so if you want to connect tonight, we're going to drop it in the chat. There's going to be a link if you're not yet connected or if your group leader hasn't reached out, we want you to get connected tonight. So it's going to be in the link in our bio and our Instagram and also on the chat. So check that out. There you go. Young adults, we love you. We'll see you at church on Sunday. We'll see you at Young Adults next Thursday. See you guys. Bye.